Hello everybody, it's Kevin Ferber again and welcome back to part two of the two videos that I've done to introduce and give you an overview of the Peugeot 205 Group B car, the Peugeot T16 Evolution 1, which is my car and Andy Medicott's, which is currently for sale at auction on the 23rd of May. I've been asked to answer a few questions, so I'm ready to go. And uh, I've also been asked to give a short history on the car itself uh, Group B rallying and Peugeot. So just to explain how the road car situation works. So as we can see behind me, this is uh, the rally car. Uh, it's an Evolution 1. I'll explain about the specification of that, but that basically means it's a rally car. But where did the 205 T16 come from? Where's the history? Get the glasses on to be serious. The history uh, started with this. This is a 205 T16 made by the factory and basically to get the project underway manufacturers had to make 200 of a certain type of special car and then from those 200 they were allowed to compete in World Rally Championships. Uh, so in order to compete you had to produce 200. Uh, these are very special cars, all Group B cars, all of the identical specification. Now at that point you could go to Peugeot and buy a road car version, I believe they were £38,000 in 1982, 3, 4 when you could first buy them uh, and the first, there was 200 made but the first 10, the chassis number 0 to uh, zero 010 were kept by Peugeot, Jean Todd apparently has chassis number 01, team boss at the time and the rest of the 10 cars were kept for press, PR, rally projects and some went to private buyers. So that's a road car version just like this. The first 10 were apparently uh, built in white. So they were all white cars, very rare cars. And then after 10, they were all grey like this one. Uh, that's a road car. Now that's not based on a, a, a Peugeot 205 GTI. It's a completely separate car. The only things that are similar are maybe the doors because they're made of metal uh, and the roof skin. But the rest of it is a space frame car uh, and it's a very special one-off. You can see this is a road car version. Uh, the back lifts up in the space frame style of how the rally cars work as well. Uh, so fundamentally, it is the chassis, it's the basic start of a rally car. Uh, same engine transmission gearbox that you would find on a rally car. So if a privateer wanted to take this car and convert it into a rally car then Peugeot actually had a kit and that kit was called an E1, an Evolution 1 kit which basically meant that you could buy all the components necessary to take this car rallying. And that kit was designed and homologated by Peugeot and that made the Evolution 1 car that we know that Ari Vatanen launched onto the World Championship. So the E1. The Evolution 1 kit in period cost another £28,000. So the very minimum that a owner would have in period is £72,000 to £75,000. Plus they had to build the car. Bringing my car into the history here. Uh, this is the chassis number from 1984 and as we can see it ends on 007. So this is number 7 of the 200. This is the earliest photo we have of chassis number 7, my car. This is John Woodner, the driver and owner uh, and it's around 1983-84 where he's come to England to inspect the car, ready to pick it up and take it to America. Now this car was converted from the road car into a competition car under the guidance of UK team boss Des O'Dell. Uh, Des for quite a few years had known John Woodner, he'd worked with him with Talbot and he built Lotus Talbot Sunbeams and competed in the American Championship. John was a great driver uh, and the, uh, the link with the UK was already established. So it was Des uh, that bought the car from Peugeot France and the kit and the spares and as it happens at the same time, they bought their own Evolution 1 car for the UK Championship. So Peugeot UK owned an additional car. That one was a dedicated recce car, an actual uh, prototype. 
This car came from the road car and, um, and it was built under Desi's guidance and then shipped to America in 1985. We now jump to 1985 in the Olympus Rally and we can see my car, the John Woodner car, chassis number seven is uh, actually car number seven on the Olympus Rally running with teammates uh, with UR Kankinen and the Works Peugeot team as they were doing the World Championship. That's one of the last rallies that John Woodner ever did before he was sadly killed in an aeroplane accident, a stunt plane accident, and then the car went into storage. Before then, John had actually competed in uh, approximately 12 to 15 rallies. Uh, this is another photo of John on a rally. And significantly, you can see a rear spoiler. So it's quite a home-built uh, spoiler. It would be unique to this car and unique to the American Championship, um, purely because that wouldn't have been allowed in the World Championship or the UK. Uh, but because of the high speed in high speed of the American Championship, uh, John thought that there was more stability to come from the car and was needed. With that in mind, when U R Kankinen's uh, works car was in uh, the Olympus Rally. Uh, we believe that they left components in order to fit a new rear wing and that's the rear wing that we see on the car today. So uh, I'm not sure whether that was a copy or it's an actual Kankanen car rear uh, wing but it, it came with the car and ultimately it was fitted in um, New Zealand by PJ. So I've jumped forward a little bit there with the history. Um, again some more photos of the car In period on various rallies and you'll find these photos across the internet. Now we jump forward quite a few years where Peter Johnson has bought the car uh, from the Wooden Estate, he's brought it to New Zealand and completely restored the car. So we see the new rear wing, uh, some of the aero fittings that would be from an Evolution 2 uh, Peugeot 205 T16 and at this point the car has actually been upgraded for competition in New Zealand at the time. However the fundamentals of the car are an Evolution 1 as per the original build uh, but I will explain those modifications in detail. But this is year 2000 on the complete uh, renovation. There's another rear wing shot uh, whilst in America. Uh, this is how I first met Peter when he came to do Donegal Rally and uh, I first met Peter and ultimately ended up being able to buy the car uh, with big help from Peter himself. Uh, Peter felt that the home for the car was much more suited to the UK and my link as a factory driver uh, helped the deal a little bit uh, and with some kind help from Peter we were able to secure the car for the UK uh, back to where it was built. Slightly changing the topic now, one of the other uh, key questions I was asked about and, and to talk about was all the different motor shows and people that we've rubbed shoulders with over the years of ownership. Uh, and one of my most memorable and favourite events was actually taking the car all the way out to almost Russia in Estonia uh, with the Peugeot Works team to put it on display. This is Marco Martin and Michael Beef Park. Uh, on the left with the car on the start ramp of the Estonian rally. Uh, that was a fantastic event. It was great to see the guys and uh, sadly Beef uh, died only a few weeks after this photo. Uh, so it's a very important photo uh, to my collection. Um, I have been to many different events, but this is Ari Vatanen. Uh, one of the first times that he's been around the car. This is a show called Race Retro. Uh, a lot of loyalty to this show. We've been going there for many years. It's Europe's most prestigious historic uh, event. And um, yeah, I mean, we've met many people. Didier Roll, Harry Toivonen, um, Mark Higgins, Colin McRae, the Opkirk. Uh, and I don't want to forget any names, but literally the car is a magnet for... Uh, drivers of a certain type who have great admiration uh, and in fact one of my favourite photos of all is this casual photo of Malcolm Wilson uh, just last year taking a look at the car whilst he was hosting a rally forum uh, and casting his memory back to when he was a Group B driver 
and actually admiring what the Peugeot Works team and the specification of the car was because he was driving Metro 6R4 uh, and he said that this car in comparison was, uh, was away in front of the 6R4's capability and if, if only he would have had the chance to drive the car in period. I think you can see that on his face. It is a real pleasure to rub shoulders with these greats of rallying um, and really the photos don't get better than that for me. Um, my all-time rallying hero, Harry Vatanen, uh, and to uh, do shows, drive the car and share the experience with drivers like Harry uh, is just superb. It's, you, you can't pay for that. Uh, and, and with that, I had to close this section, which is talking about the shows of... Uh, we've had invites from every international show. Uh, we often get uh, at least assisted to turn up and arrive. We definitely get special deals. We've been invited all over the world. Barbados is an invite that's out there that's waiting, uh, and it, it would really suit that island. So uh, hopefully the new owner will take the car on shows and certainly... Um, think about Barbados, it would be unbelievable to take the car there. Um, it fits into the international categories of display driving, so motor clubs like Slowly Sideways, rallying with Group B, uh, every event that they run they would uh, be more than willing to help and encourage you to come along, and that's to attend shows like Rally GB, uh, Goodwood Festival of Speed, Rally Show, uh, Race Retro, uh, different international events that we've done in Holland. I, I mean, basically, it's an open door. This car kicks doors down for rally event organisers. It's uh, not only because the car itself is fantastic and it's capable of running and starting, so it's a great display car, but also that there's no other or very few T16s in private hands uh, where the owners will actually take them to display. Uh, so it's a very, very um, prestigious car uh, with a very limited ownership. Now we jump into photos of the car uh, as it's being stored at the moment. So these photos are just one week old. Um, the car's in immaculate condition. It's just been prepared for the sale. It looks absolutely superb. Now I'm going to split how I talk about the car because there's the physical uh, preparation and look and style of the vehicle and then there's the mechanical components that I should talk about that help this car still be used in display uh, and to run alongside competition cars uh, at the moment. Uh, and then also along with the presentation style there's the visual appearance of the car from outside because it is quite a unique car. The first thing that I want to address is the uh, parts that we've modified over and above the Evolution 1. So what that means is components that are new that have been replaced in order for us to be able to run the car safely and reliably. Uh, this, all these modifications were done by Peter Johnson in New Zealand, year 2000. Um, first one, brakes. From a safety point of view, the brakes have been upgraded and new calipers, obviously all new brake lines, completely stripped the car back, uh, but they're non-Peugeot Evo comp uh, components. They are uh, unique brakes to this car. And because of the size of the brakes, uh, that's, that's meant that we've had to have new wheels. So those wheels are not of period. And again, from a safety point of view, that's quite a critical thing because we can get modern day tires uh, to fit and you get a very strong uh, new wheel rather than a wheel that's 35 years old. Um, so from a display point of view, we've got new uh, brakes and wheels. We've also got a new exhaust system, which has been specially manufactured in order to comply with event noise restrictions. So we do have the original uh, exhaust silencer, but it would be very impractical to ever take that car running that noise level at a modern day event, especially display events. Um, you, you, you wouldn't be able to run it for noise check problems. So it's great that it's got new exhaust. Uh, the turbocharger has been replaced with a current, uh, well, say current, year 2000 uh, WRC Peugeot 206. So it's the same uh, turbo that was used on a uh, 206 World Rally car. Uh, again, for reliability, the fact that we can replace them. Uh, and actually, they spin up much quicker than they used to do. So it's actually a, a performance enhancement. Linking in with that, there's the engine management system, which includes fuel injection and timing, and it's a Pectel system. 
uh, which in year 2000, state of the art, uh, and uh, it's fully mappable, tunable, uh, it includes anti-lag setup, and it's been tuned uh, a few times actually. It was tuned in New Zealand for competition fuel purposes at full power, and then we detuned it in England to make it run on pump fuel and lowered the rev limit to uh, help the car be more reliable as we didn't need any out and out power. The car, even in restricted mode at 7,200 revs, is about uh, 320 to 340 horsepower at the wheels on the dyno. Uh, and that's a very reliable amount of power and more than enough to drive. Um, then we have a, a completely new wiring loom, uh, which is again fantastic for uh, reliability issues and uh, seats and safety equipment. Then from outside the car, Oh, and um, when I'm looking at this type of engine bay shot as well, we can see the exhaust, but the vast majority of shiny bits are period components. Um, however, absolutely everything has been taken off, restored, either repurposed or refreshed. So where they did have original chrome components, they've been re-chromed. Uh, these rear mug guards, for example, are now fully carbon fibre. In period, they were uh, plastic. Um, and completely brand new paint and you know stripped back to a standard car. The authenticity of Group B is clearly maintained as everything is in its homologated position and everything is as the Peugeot Evolution 1 uh, would have been. So the oil coolers, turbocharger, um, the way that it takes air in, the, uh, all the chassis, every part of the uh, cars, connections which is all the chassis the bottom arms suspension uh, other suspension um, shock absorbers are proflex and all new in period adjustable as well okay uh, and I, i'll at this point i'll say that the the components that remain absolutely uh, of period 1984 are the gearbox h pattern six speed uh, all the drive train uh, front of the car that's the prop shaft uh, front differential, drive shafts, um, hubs, all that type of thing is as period. Transfer box, all as period. Uh, engine, that's a, a good thing to bring up. In year 2000, the engine was updated. Uh, uh, there's a lot of people from outside that believe that the uh, Group B 205T16 had a unique engine. In actual fact, it was unique at the time but just about every Peugeot uh, 16 valve, if I'll show you the engine, 16 valve engine that is on a production car now is based on the same engine. So uh, if you were to buy a brand new 106, 206, even the diesel engine, you effectively get this uh, engine. So there are many different specifications but that's actually one of the, the cheapest uh, parts of the car that would be very easy to replace. And if you wanted to, you could spend a lot of money uh, tuning it to any limit because they're still manufacturing the head, the block, obviously all the pistons, the, you know, everything to do with the engine. It's still new and that's a really uh, refreshing part of this car is the engine is, uh, is still an off-the-shelf uh, unit that people are still tuning all over the world uh, to different specifications. And, and we do have the original cylinder head and some of the original components, um, but in period, they weren't reliable. So the last thing you would want is a 35 year old period engine. They are much stronger and better now. Now here we are with the most recent photos of the car. And I'm going to highlight a few parts that are unique with this car. Um, they've been put onto the car because the car's evolved this way, but actually in tribute to the Peugeot uh, 205 Evolution 2 from the body kit from outside. It's the most recognisable uh, shape, I would say, of the Peugeot 205 T16s. It starts on the front here with these air ducts working as a front aerofoil, uh, helping the car be more stable, but really they're there more as a visual. The rest of the front of the car is actually Evolution 1, um, so that's as you would expect the car to be. From the rear, 
we can see mud flaps and significantly this blue uh, body effect, which is again is a, is a concept brought from the evolution too. That body effect, the ground effect, was banned for most rallies, even for the EVO 2. But we've just put it on there as a, a, an acknowledgement to the development of EVO 2s. Uh, rear period mud flaps, and uh, we can see the rear aerofoil, which again makes the car, uh, for many people, look like an Evolution 2, but it's an Evolution 1 car. So the only thing that's realistically Evolution 2 from the, this angle is the aero diffuser for the rear uh, and the, as we can see, the aerofoil to the rear. Now it could be that a new owner would want to take the car back to the original 1984 specification. That would be very easy to do to take the spoiler off uh, and maybe take the aero pack off. Um, from my point of view, I'm really proud of its history with Peter Johnson. He competed it in that way. And I like the uh, story and the history of the car that from 1984, it came from UK Peugeot. It, it uh, went to America for the American Championship. It had some bespoke, unique designs, that rear area foil. Uh, and then it went to New Zealand and PGA to suit his Targa rallies. Uh, also developed the car and completed the rear aerofoil kit and put on some new components. Um, so personally, I like the car the way that it is. It tells its own unique historical story. Um, but if you wanted to, you could simply take the aero pack off and it would be 1984 specification. To complete the video, the final question I've been asked, uh, and I am asked it, probably the most common question is what is the car like to drive uh, and how's the experience been as an owner well my history as a rally driver and the Peugeot team I mean this car is part of my DNA and um, so to own it has been a dream come true as it would be for anybody uh, one of the nice things that I never anticipated uh, in the ownership experience is within the first six months of owning the car, I met somebody at a rally show, and that was Andrew Medicott, came over, added a chat, told me about his absolute dream and wish to have owned this type of car. We formed a friendship, uh, and which remains to this day from 15 years. Now, that friendship uh, eventually led to us sharing the car and sharing the ownership experience. So Andrew half owns the car and I half own the car. Um, generally speaking, I do most of the competition driving because the car can be, uh, well, it's very expensive and it's very um, precious. So I was about to say that it was difficult to drive, but I'll explain that in a different way. It's not for the faint hearted, that's for sure. And Andrew has very little experience. However, Andrew, as somebody that has never driven a rally car at all, has driven the car and has lived the dream. So in his own way, uh, Andrew has potentially had more value out of the ownership of the car than me because from my point of view as a competition driver I've always wanted to drive the car flat out as fast as it will go and skid everywhere and I've been able to do that but with an awful lot of uh, control and restriction uh, and uh, self-control. From Andrew's point of view um, he's driven faster uh, he's lived the dream, he's experienced the car, and he has an awful lot of respect for the car. So we, as two different, uh, a competition driver, and as a fan of the car, we've experienced the car on two completely different levels. Uh, and that's been a joy for me to watch Andrew uh, really appreciate the car uh, from his point of view. And obviously Andrew gets to sit with me and can see the car being driven um, a bit more aggressively. Uh, with a little bit more flair and certainly uh, at speed a bit safer than Andrew could do himself. So it's been a great experience and I don't believe there's many people that own cars, that share cars and enjoy the car the way that we both have. Completely different levels of the scale. Now along with that we go to a show, we share it together, we both have VIP permits to get into the events, uh, we treated with great respect uh, from the event organisers and the nice thing with it, if one of us is busy, the other one will talk to fans or um, you know, help show people around the car, we'll arrange things. And then when we do a more serious event, then of course we've got to have a co-driver and a driver. That usually falls on me as the driver and the, and the co-driver, so it's great. Now, 
I have also been asked what's it like to drive from a competition point of view. And with that, I think inevitably comes the expense. Well, the one thing I can tell you, we've only ever brought two sets of tyres. It came on a set of racing tyres. I put a set of road tyre Yokohama tyres on the car and we've never wore those tyres out. Um, in the 15 years that we've owned it, we've rebuilt the engine. Um, once we've rebuilt and put a new gearbox in, that's quite important, that new gearbox being the six speed original, taking out the sequential box that PJ put in uh, because that had jumping out of gear issues. Um, and that gearbox, is uh, the new H pattern box, is much easier for people to drive. Although you do have to respect the fact that this gearbox is itself 30 years old. So although it was built probably eight years ago, um, it, they, these are still um, precious components that need to be treated with respect. Uh, we've had a new front differential in the time uh, that we've been there and the diff uh, because we did a Manx International Rally and we had a mechanical failure there and we replaced the whole casing. We were able to find that uh, as a used component. Uh, and then we've had no other issues. Um, the, the, reality of, the reality of owning the car, and any car like this, is that we don't use it every week. So sometimes we come to start it after three months, even six months uh, before the car's been started. It might be in winter and it's just left in storage so it can be problematic um, not to start it necessarily but the battery could be flat you need to uh, ideally prime the oil system uh, and really have a think about how to behave with this car but i can tell you many cars like this have a full team of mechanics behind them what me and andy have been able to do over the last six or seven years is do the routine service work with dedicated mechanics uh, like Warren Heath, uh, who's done a lot of prep, and in particular, Ian Gwynn from BGM Sport, and Ian's a fantastic guy, knows this car inside out, uh, and he's ready and available and willing to either to do a full package of uh, looking after the car if you need to, taking it to the car, servicing it, driver tuition even, uh, and from, from that point of view, there's somebody that knows the car, and I can't recommend enough that people get involved with somebody like Ian Gwynn uh, because he's got everything you would need as a historical car owner. You know, and access to an airfield, uh, a, a safe environment, he understands how to tune these cars, great mechanical sympathy and a fantastic workshop. So the involvement with Ian Gwynn has been great, but I want to bring it back to the fact that myself and Andy, as two people, load this car, start it, take it to shows, we don't take mechanics with us and we generally run the car. And for eight years, uh, that's been a, a simple procedure for us to do. So I, I'm, that probably explains the ownership uh, to most people. It, it, can I describe the car as reliable? Well, it's a, it's a classic car. They've all got their issues that need to be dealt with and you shouldn't underestimate that. But on the flip side, we've been able to do it single-handedly and I'm no great mechanic. So it's literally just starting the car, taking it to an event, treat it with respect, and then take it to the next event. We spend a lot of time cleaning it, and if you want to be serious about the events that you're doing, you need to get somebody like Ian Gwynn involved with the car and run it in a professional way, and run it in a way that it deserves, to be honest. That brings us to the end of this video. I'm almost sad to get to the end. For anybody that's been watching it right to the end, uh, I appreciate your time and, uh, and attention. <laughs> I hope it was entertaining. Uh, and informative to you. If you do need a, a personal answer uh, about any question, or if you're thinking of buying the car and you do bid, you, you can tell from my attitude that I'll be more than willing to help you get to know the car. Uh, I'll be available to come and tutor if you'd like to know about it, uh, introduce you to the people that have already worked on the car, uh, etc. So uh, enjoy the bidding. Uh, like me, if you're just a fan, uh, then let's watch the auction online and on May the 23rd, it's only next Saturday, uh, let's see how the car sells and probably more excitingly, who the new owner of the car will be. Bye.